Last week we saw an astonishing game between Gary Kasparov and Robert Hübner where Kasparov mated Hübner about three different ways. Tonight we come to the last game in round three of this tournament being played in the Hyatt Regency Hotel here in Brussels and it's between the two Englishmen, John Nunn and Nigel Short, who is in fact the top-ranked Englishman. Now the interesting thing about tonight's game is that although Nigel Short has a slightly better rating than John Nunn, John Nunn in fact stands plus five. Bill, do you think that this means that John Nunn has got the Indian sign over our friend Nigel Short? A lot of people, including myself, have plus scores against Nigel Short because he's so young and we, we all beat him a lot when he was about 11 years old. Um, I, I think he's, what Short is trying to learn now is how to become a genuine world, world title contender and he's just got into the top ten in the world, he's establishing himself there and he's, he's not quite sure of his style yet. Um, he finds it difficult, I think, playing against um, Miles and Nunn uh, because they've been the top English players for so long. Actually, he always beats Miles, but why he's lost so many games to Nunn, I don't know. So he should have ambitions here in Brussels of pulling back a couple of points and being only minus three at the end of this fortnight? Oh, I think so. Now that he's ranked um, in the top ten, uh, he, he should be trying to beat people like Nunn, yes. Right, well, in fact, the game's begun. Show us how it did begin. Short as black, none as white. Um, a few years ago, Short would never have played this move. Uh, when people um, defend the, the Rai Lopez, the, uh, playing symmetrically, answering this with this, it's normally an indication that black is content to try to equalize. Now, normally, young players uh, try to imbalance the position. Short used to play the French defense, or Sicilian or something, but... Um, Short has told me recently that he's now becoming an old man. He's playing like Spassky and Karpov and defending this, this Ray Lopez. Actually, it's awful because last week Kasparov was saying he was becoming an old man and he's all of 24 and Short's all of, what, 22? These chess players, like policemen, all look so young these days. Now, this is a standard um, uh, opening system. It must have been played in thousands of games. Um, black. Uh, starts off by defending this pawn and um, later he usually tries to strong point it in the center. He adopts a formation with pawns just here and here. Uh, everything defending this one, just holding ground in the center and later trying to expand on the, the queen side. Now what white is trying to do is build the big center of pawns, pawns here and here. So black, um, first of all, just holding his ground. That's a necessary move for white. Uh, White finds that if he advances this pawn too quickly, he can't maintain his position after the bishop pins the knight. There's too much pressure on the center, so this is a necessary preparatory move to advancing in the center. This was all worked out um, around 1900. And interestingly, Short plays uh, a system that was uh, uh, very much in fashion in the early years of this century. Um, Nowadays, you more often see the knight rerouted back here and onto this square to support the centre. But this move attacking the bishop was was very fashionable um, for about 50 years, about 1910 to 1960. And black now has the both pawns here, uh, putting pressure on white's centre pawn, but a potential weakness on this square. Now white was attacking this with a uh, with pawn and knight. So the queen adds to the defense on the diagonal. Now black has the choice um, either to make some exchanges in the center. The real question in this sort of position is what's going to happen in the center. Either all of these pawns will get exchanged, which could leave black with an isolated pawn here. Um, or a pair of the pawns could get exchanged. Uh, sometimes it's white who makes the exchanges and then tries to bring a knight to this square. Sometimes it's, it's black who initiates the exchanges. So, to Nigel Short, playing black. My biggest problem with my opening preparation in this game was I didn't do any. And the good reason for this is that John and I decided to save ourselves lugging heavy suitcases around. So we, we only took half the books and we do our opening preparation 
together. Now, unfortunately, all the books are in John's room, so as I'm sure he's been <laughs> preparing away quite uh, merrily, you, here I am stuck, and so uh, I think I'll play something a little bit unusual, Night C6. Well, this move is a surprise to me. I've only been playing these mainline Spanish positions for a couple of months. Uh, previously, I played all sorts of eccentric and dubious rubbish. But uh, now I at least know that my first few moves are OK, even if the later ones probably aren't. But this move is uh, slightly unusual. It looks very logical here to play D5. Normally, closing the center is not such a good idea because it releases some of the pressure from Black's position. But I gain time by attacking his knight, and this might make the difference. Anyhow, um, I'm sure we'll be on our own within a few moves in any case. So I'll play d5. Now, one of Black's biggest problems in the closed Spanish is this knight, which is attacked on c6, because uh, frequently it gets... Uh, left out of the game, sort of wandering around on A5 and B7, going nowhere in particular. But one of the advantages of the a move order which I've played is I can retreat my knight to D8. And then I have some possibilities with uh, regrouping it on the, on the king side later. So, knight D8. I think my main area of attack must be on the king side. But I'd also like to seize control of the A file as well if I can, being a rather greedy person. I could do that by playing A4 immediately. But I don't suppose it makes very much difference whether I play A4 now or next move. So I'll keep my options open. I'll play Knight F1. Mm, that's interesting. I expected A4. Um, well, there is a, a standard plan here, which is similar in a way to uh, Czech Benoni positions and that's to play for the move f5 and in order to achieve that I must remove my knight from f6 and uh, prepare it with g6 so um, logical move here is uh, knight e8 I think I'd better go about getting this a file now because if I don't do it now it might go away so I'll play a4 uh-huh so just a, a harmless transposition. He's threatening to take on b5, so I'll see the a file. I'll just rook b8. The only logical continuation is to take on b5. I have, of course, recaptured with the pawn. I think it would be in my favour to have a closed position on the queen side. I might be able to do this by playing b4 here then he'll have to worry about the possibility of my taking on c5. So sooner or later he'll probably have to play c4, and then we'll get a block pawn structure on the queen side, which is what I want. So I'll play b4 and see whether or not he replies c4. I have a, a slight uh, dilemma at the moment, whether to allow him at some point to take on c5, or to just close the position immediately. I'm feeling slightly lazy today, so I, I don't want to have to think about B takes C5 in, in all positions, so I'll, I'll just close it. C4. Bill, John Nunn has been Nigel Short second in all sorts of important events that Nigel's played in. Uh, is Nigel right to play a bit lazily, a bit passively? I, I'm surprised at what Nigel's doing in this game. When, when he played um, this very old opening variation, I think he wanted to play something that he and John Nunn hadn't looked at together, but um, it looks as though Nigel hasn't looked at it at all, because uh, his last move um, makes me worry that he doesn't really actually have any ideas in this thing. If we look at the move, the advance of the pawn to this square, um, this is a move that Black doesn't want to play in this position. There's a, there's a highly sophisticated strategy for White in this line, which was worked out by Karpov, um, which is why the whole thing hasn't been played for Black for about ten years. Now, White's idea with this move was to lure the black pawn onto here. And it's actually part of White's kingside attacking plan to play the pawn from here to here. Um, when White has advanced that pawn, of course, after moving his knight out of the way first, when White's advanced that pawn, he wants to get the black pawn off this square to exchange it for the white pawn. 
And then if that black pawn moves, then white has this beautiful square for his knight. Now, if a white knight ever gets to that square, it's threatening to come in here sometimes, it's attacking this pawn, it can go to the king's side. Now, theoretically, black should try to keep his pawn on this square for as long as possible. And to give up the fight like that, just advancing here, is lazy. Black should, be try should have been trying to support the pawn. Now, um, black has a slightly inferior position from the opening, but uh, he's accepted this, this without a fight. And so it seems possible that none will not be displeased, none to play. Now I've got uh, an optimum position on the queen's side. The A-file's open, I control it. And uh, also the E3 to A7 diagonal is open, so in some positions I might be able to support my rook going down to A7. Anyhow, I want to get going on the king's side now, so I'll continue my little knight tour and play knight G3. To continue with my plan, simply G6. That stops my knight from going any further, for example, to f5. And it also starts his plan of playing knight g7, f6, and knight f7 to get these knights off the back rank into decent positions. My own plan on the king's side must involve playing the move f4. It's the only way to open things up. So I've got to move my knight on f3 out of the way. The only reasonable place it can go is h2, so I'll play knight h2. Well, obviously he's intending f4 at some moment. But this doesn't seem like such a worry immediately. Because if I continue normally with knight g7, then if f4, I have a very annoying move, bishop h4, pinning his knight on g3. Then if he defends with queen f3, then I think f5 is very unpleasant for white because suddenly his pieces become uh, tactical weaknesses. So I'm quite happy so far. Knight g7. f4 seems the logical move but he can play bishop h4 which is slightly annoying because my knight will be pinned for a couple of moves. Well, I mean, it might be okay for me, but I don't really want to bother to work it out. And in any case, I can just play a preparatory move because black has no threat at the moment. So I'll get my rook off its present square, which allows this nasty pin, and play rook f1. Hmm. I didn't consider this move properly. Somehow I've been hoping for a mistake from John, but um, he doesn't seem to have made any yet. I can play h5 and then if f4, h4, but it looks terribly weakening. I have a strong temptation to develop this knight on d8, just simply playing f6, but then f4 is coming and then if I take, then he simply recaptures and white has all the play. His knight is coming to f3 to d4. And, well, I just don't like this. I mean, I'm in a very passive position. I'd like at some moment to be able to challenge on the a-file uh, by playing rook a8. But I've got so many pieces on the back row, it's uh, looking rather difficult. I think I'll try and prepare that with bishop d7, but uh, it's not a move I really like, because after f4, I'm still very passive. But anyway, bishop d7. That's a slightly peculiar move. I'm not really sure what it does. If there are going to be a lot of complications on the king's side, then the fact that the second rank is blocked might prove to be good for me. At any rate, there seems no reason now why I can't play f4, since my rook's on a better square, so here we go. Well, if f6 now, then he simply plays f5, and the position starts to resemble greatly a very famous game between Karpov and Unzika and uh, it's actually <laughs> my favorite game of all time and where uh, Karpov won crushingly by controlling the entire board. So 
Well, if I take on f4, bishop takes f4. I don't like it. My knight on g7 is very bad, and I'm still a long way from getting my knight to e5. So I, I want to try and confuse him now. I hit his knight on g3, bishop h4. Then maybe I have some tricky things with uh, f5 at some moment. Okay, bishop h4. The knight's attacked. I certainly don't want to move it back again unless I'm absolutely forced to. But I can play queen f3, which is my intention. And although the queen is sort of opposite black's rook on f8, if black, for example, plays f5, the fact that the rooks on f8 is undefended means that a lot of the tactics will be in my favour. So queen f3 looks like the right move. Well, taking on f4 doesn't make any sense, so I should continue logically with uh, f5. Well, one likes to think of Nigel Short as possibly being one day a challenger to Kasparov for the World Championship, but somehow one can't quite imagine Kasparov playing in this almost depressed sort of way. That is a feature of Nigel's style, um, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, but Kasparov is, of course, world champion. I, mean, I can't imagine any world champion playing in that sort of way. Nigel's got some way to go. But he does have a phenomenal record of winning games from bad positions. I and mean, he can start feeling very depressed and fight back. And the, his last move just opened the position. And uh, it's the sort of position where he's, he's good at. No matter how depressed he sounds, he, I think he likes to get his opponents into a false sense of security. It, because the crunch is coming now, now that lines are becoming open. So it's uh, Nigel Short's second John Lund to play. Now it becomes sharp. I've got to start calculating concrete variations. Let's suppose somehow that these pawns are all exchanged in the centre and that he keeps recapturing with a pawn whenever possible. So I'll worry about the order of these later. Then in a resulting position, which is like this, only that the pawns at e4, f4, d6 and g6 have gone. I've got a combination. I can play knight takes f5. Then if he plays knight takes f5, I've got queen g4 check. If he plays bishop takes f5, I've got g4. And if he plays rook takes f5, I've got bishop takes f5, bishop takes f5, g4, e4, only move, or else mate on f8, queen f4. Now after exchange of queens, both the f5 bishop and the rook on b8 are hanging. So how should I make these exchanges? Well, if I play e takes f5, he can take on g3 and then play bishop takes f5 which stops me from taking on e5. So I should make the other capture first. After f takes e5, if he recaptures with a d pawn, then I take on f5. So the only way you can throw a spanner in the works is to answer f takes e5 by f4. Well, I'm sure I must have something good there. I can even play the peace sacrifice knight f5. And then after g takes f5, queen takes f4, bishop e7, e6, followed by taking on f5, with three pawns in the attack for the piece. Yeah, that looks good. I'll play f takes e5. Oh, it seems like I've had a, another attack of brain death because I intended to play f4 at this moment, but he can simply retreat the knight to e2 and then I, I recapture on e5. And then g3 is rather unpleasant. I can sacrifice a piece with bishop takes g3 knight takes g3 and knight f7 intending knight g5 and then maybe knight g4 oh well in that case I'm reduced to capturing this pawn which is not what I intended I'm afraid that sir e takes f5 is going to be very strong for white but uh, I mean what can I do now I have to recapture d takes e5 it's starting to look rather good for me now. I take on f5, and if he takes with the pawn, I have this combination with taking on f5. But on the other hand, if he exchanges on g3 first to stop the combination, then without his black square bishop, his king is going to be very exposed. Yes, I'm beginning to like this now. E takes f5. <sighs> mm. This is very uncomfortable. Of course, I'm starting to miss things left, right, and centre here. I, I'd like to play bishop takes g3, queen takes g3, 
bishop takes f5, which is the positional approach, but unfortunately this allows knight g4. And then the undefended state of my rook on f8 becomes uh, of major importance. I can't take on c2, knight h6 check, and then rook takes f8, mate. And the threat of knight takes h6 and my undefended e-pawn just means that my game is completely lost. Well, if I take on f5, I mean, he has numerous things here. I mean, even knight g4 is very strong. While I really don't like this position, also I'm running very short of time here. Well, if I take on g3 and play knight takes f5, I mean, this looks horrible because without my dark squared bishop, I'm incredibly weak, especially on the king side, but at least I have some activity then. Okay, give it a try. Bishop takes g3. Recapturing on g3 is forced. Knight takes f5. Where should the queen go? It's a toss-up between f2 and e1, really. e1 attacks the pawn on e5, but f2 pins the knight for the moment. Also on f2, the queen can perhaps go to c5 in some positions, or maybe even support rook a7. Yes, queen f2 also threatens just something like knight g4 followed by bishop g5. That looks the right square. I thought this move was a mistake. He has some ideas with queen c5 and rook a7, and maybe at some moment. Now I can develop my problem child with a concrete th threat. If I play knight to b7, this rules out possibilities of rook a7 and queen c5. And then I have a, a counter threat of knight d4 hitting his queen on f2. So I, I, I thought maybe he should have played queen e1, but uh, hmm, I don't know what he's planning. Maybe just knight f3 after that. I don't know. I think this move's a mistake. Knight b7. So the knight finally gets off the back rank. Well, the move I'd really like to play here is knight g4, because it means I can answer his threat of knight d4 with knight f6 check. After knight g4, I have all sorts of threats, bishop g5, for example, perhaps rook a6. But now I see that knight g4, perhaps he's intending to play h5. Yes, that, that could be a bit awkward. If the knight moves, again, he's got knight d4. But, but one moment, after knight g4, h5, I've got rook a6. Oh, that's a really lovely move. If he takes the knight, well, it must be mate. And on the other hand, if he blocks the sixth rank by playing knight from b7 to d6, then my own knight can just take the pawn on e5. Yes, that looks really crushing. All my pieces would be cooperating in uh, an attack against his king. So, knight g4. What the hell is he doing here? If I just play h5, then knight e3, knight d4. What's he doing? I really don't understand. I Surely he should have played knight f3, but even then I ha have some chances. Well, I don't have very much time, so I'll, I'll play it quickly. h5. Ah, uh, yes. Now, is rook a6 really as strong as I think? If he takes the knight, rook takes g6 check. Knight g7 is forced. Rook takes g7 check. King takes g7. Bishop h6 check. And if king takes bishop, queen h4 check and queen h7 mate. On the other hand, if the king goes to the back rank, then queen takes f8 check and rook takes f8 mate. Yes, this looks really crushing. Rook a6. My goodness, where did that come from? Oh, that's stupid, because I just simply overlooked this move. I see if I take on g4, then rook takes g6 is leading to forced mate. Well, what can I do? Knight b d6, knight takes e5. King g7, he can play bishop h6 check. Ah, oh, this is terrible. Well, 
I suppose it's not so surprising with all these pieces aimed at my king. No, it's, this is clearly lost. Knight B to D6 is as good as resigning, so, uh, well, let's take a piece and pray. H takes G4. So, Rook takes G6, check. I'll try Knight G7. I mean, if he hasn't seen Rook takes G7, check, then maybe I have some chances. Uh, Queen H4, I can exchange on f1 and perhaps play bishop e8 but i mean i'm, I'm certain he's seen it uh, he played this move rook a6 with a flurry anyway knight g7 yes it seems to be mating four now with rook takes g7 check well <coughs> looks like the end my only question is i'm wondering where i went wrong in this game it's not entirely obvious to me right? If C4 really was the decisive mistake, then uh, it's a very difficult position for black. <laughs> anyway, yeah, time to give up. Right, well, there we are, Bill. He's resigned, but I'm black. I take his rook. Oh, what's he do? He mates in three minutes. Go on, then. After the king takes the rook, it's check from the bishop. That's giving up another piece there. Now, if, if Black's king moves backwards, then uh, White gives up his queen as well. Queen takes the rook with check. Rook would take the queen. And then White's rook would come down and give mate. And the, the, the prettier line, if Black takes everything, Black eats the bishop as well, then Queen comes out with check. No choice, King must go back. And then the last check his mate, queen protected by the bishop, and the rook covering the open line. Nigel said at the beginning of this game that he didn't really feel like doing certain things, that he felt lazy. What always fascinates me about watching Kasparov, the world champion, is that he never, ever gives the impression of feeling lazy, even if he's completely exhausted. Chess is always a mixture of, of routine and inspiration. Um, sometimes you have to recognize that there is only one good move in the position, and you have to recognize the sort of position, and you sit there and work until you find it. Kasparov does that every move. He wants to play the best move every time. He's not going to make any concessions to practicality. Now, in the game we just saw, we saw several lazy decisions by Nigel. He played moves that, that looked okay, that he just felt were fine. He just didn't, didn't he seemed to play without energy. Okay. Where Kasparov gets his energy from, I don't know. It's, it's not possible to think that hard for five or six hours a day. And it, it seems to me that Kasparov has worked very hard to study positions, to learn moves, to be able to play almost automatically from back references. It's more Kasparov's work rate actually at the board that impresses me. I mean, his, his knowledge is phenomenal. But seeing the work he puts into while he's playing, that, that's what's really impressive. Bill, thank you. Right, so John Nunn wins yet another game against his old friend and rival Nigel Short. He now stands plus six, and that leaves the position looking like this at the end of round three in this tournament. The world champion, Gary.